again. <clears throat> Father God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us. Speak to us this morning, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. First, I'm going to say praise to God alone that I my exams yesterday were sustained by the committee. I told the Lord if I passed those orals, I would praise him in the assembly. So here I am doing that. <clears throat> My sermon text comes from Matthew 10, 34 through 39, and in case you're wondering, once we read it here in a second, I didn't pick this passage, but I'm, I'm grateful to preach it. So let's stand for the reading of God's holy word found in the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39. 10, 34 through 39. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Let me just start with a, a note. Jesus never anywhere in the Gospels calls his followers to merit their salvation. Nowhere. It's clear from Scripture that he alone justifies us. However, as his followers, he often calls us to costly obedience and great sacrifice in order to make his name great and to point us to the one true sacrifice. So as we dive into the text this morning, let's remember that. So before coming into ministry, I was an artillery officer. To be exact, I was a multiple launch rocket systems officer. I promise you that makes you a much better preacher to be a rocket launcher officer. A rocket can shoot anywhere from 20 miles, but a missile that also can be propelled out of our, our launchers can shoot up to 250 miles. And that's off the record. <laughs> so we're training down at White Sands Missile Range, which is in southern New Mexico, and we're using live rounds. And of course, there's lots of precautions that are taken. You need to make sure that every part of the rocket lands in the firing zone. If not, there could be issues. So as the story goes, I shoot my rockets. We're competing for the best time. I have the best spot, but there's one officer following me. And he's, he starts firing his rockets. Everything's going as planned. His time's looking better than mine. But suddenly, to everyone's surprise, a rocket shoots out. And instead of hit, going on its planned trajectory, it takes off at a diagonal, just in a crazy direction. It went about 200 feet and then over the mountain and out of sight. A moment of silence <laughs> and shock and then chaos breaks out the colonel of course jumps in his Jeep and drives towards the firing point doesn't know what's going on the range safety call headquarters they shut down the entire base all of Fort Bliss too because they don't know where this rocket is landed the big question is what kind of damage could it have caused so praise God it flew on the other side of the mountain and it it landed and no hikers were there. Nothing bad happened. And one of the fins had broken off, causing it to take off in this direction. It was a malfunction. And this is kind of a funny story. But the truth is, right, the truth is that there could have been terrible damage. That how far these rockets could go, they could, it could have hit El Paso. It could have gone into New Mexico somewhere else. It could have gone into Mexico, any of these places. But for that, those few hours that we didn't know that, there was just no peace. And when rockets are fired, whether they're misfired or they're intentionally targeted, it brings chaos. It brings chaos. Warfare brings chaos. When Jesus says in the opening part of this verse, he says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. He is virtually saying in ancient warfare terms that he's come to bring chaos. What's this mean? I thought that Jesus' mission was about peace. Isn't Jesus the Prince of Peace? These are good questions. 
And we can answer some of this by looking at the context in Matthew and in our chapter. And if, if we remember, the Gospel of Matthew stands out because of its focus on Jesus' messianic and kingly rule and how he fulfills Old Testament prophecy. We can see this in the genealogy, that the, the genealogy, genealogy goes from Abraham following David's kingly line. We also see this in the narrative. We see this that the wise men, these other kings, bring homage to the true king. We see this in the Beatitudes, that Jesus is the prophet king who studies and fulfills and teaches the true meaning of the law. After the Beatitudes, it says he was teaching as one who had great authority. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus' kingly rule, his authority extends to the whole earth. So if we go back to our, our illustration about rockets and misfires and warfare, and this part's important. We need to see that the analogy breaks down because at this point, although man wages war with swords, atomic bombs, cyber warfare, whatever, Jesus' kingdom isn't established that way. We see this in Matthew 26 that a crowd comes and the text tells us that they come bringing with them clubs and swords. They seize Jesus and one of his disciples pulls out a sword and cuts off an ear. And what's Jesus say? Jesus says, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do not think that I cannot appeal to my father and a second there won't be 12 legions of angels around me. Again, who has that kind of power? What kind of king, though? Here's the question. What kind of king doesn't use that power? Only a king whose kingdom is not fulfilled in the same way that kings of the earth do. So the point here in Matthew 10 is Jesus is not talking about taking up physical weapons or waging <laughs> guerrilla warfare. But let's look further. What does the text tell us? How is this warfare going to play out? If we look at verses 35 through 39. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. There's a few things for us to notice. This loss of peace or this chaos that happens in the text, it's going to occur in the family unit. Makes it really clear. Second thing is, if you notice here, husband and wife aren't mentioned. And I think the point is, is that God expects there to be unity and calling for husbands and wives. In terms of the family, there's this implied expectation that there is going to be commitment, love, and loyalty amongst the family. But that commitment, that commitment will be stand over and against Jesus calling, up, calling us to follow him. And if you do follow him, some of these people, their loyalty, they might turn against you. And they'll even become your enemies. He also says this, if you love your family more than him, you're not worthy to follow him. He also says, Jesus says clearly, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is unworthy to follow me. Lastly, he summarizes all of this, I think, when he says, if you're willing to find your life, you'll lose it. And if you lose your life, you'll find it. So if we, if we read this text, we probably think about it, and either we think the text is harsh, and we dismiss it out of that, or maybe we dismiss it because we come from believing families and thank God that in redemptive history, this point is true, that God is redeeming whole families. Regardless, though, I think there's a chance that we miss the depth of what Jesus is calling us to. The commentaries are helpful here, but in the Old Testament, and at this time, and, and, and this time in, in Israel, families were more than just your relationship with your brothers and sisters. Families were about calling. Families gave stability. They provided employment and business contacts. Reputation mattered. Second thing is families were about security and welfare. If somebody died and, and there, was, uh, there was a mother who was left without a husband and without a son, the uncle or someone else was supposed to come take care of them. There was no social security. There was no Uncle Sam giving a welfare check. And thirdly, identi identity. Families were how people found identity. Think about James, the son of Zebedee, or all the different names in the Old Testament. That's where your identity lied. And we might miss some of this in 21st century America. 
But it's still this idea of calling and security, financial stability and identity. Who am I? But let's not trivialize this. This is a tough word. If we follow, a big if, it's not without great fear. It's not without great hesitation and trepidation. The decision, this kind of decision won't be taken lightly, but it also cannot, it cannot take a back seat. Jesus does not mince his words. He says, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So there's a couple things we should note here. First is that Jesus speaks with authority. We saw this in Matthew. This is what he's doing. He speaks with authority. If anyone else made this demand on you, you should say they're crazy. You should say, I'm not following this guy. If anyone else made this demand on you, you should say that. But Jesus demands this. This is the one who raised the girl to life. This is the one who walked on water. This is the one who calmed the storm. This is the one who rose from the grave. He makes this demand and he is worth following. Think about it. He's the only one, the only one who was once dead and is now alive. He's the only one who calls us to follow him in that way because he has the authority over the grave. He does. And we see this in 2 Corinthians. Paul says this, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself. Our, our light, is our momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. We could put it this way. God calls us to lose our lives, yes. He calls us to lose our worldly identities because he will ultimately give us new life. He's going to give us life eternal with him. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this. Jesus makes this demand because he gives us a new family. In Romans 8, Paul says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery... We're not just servants and slaves and of fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God. And this is one of the greatest testimonies in Scripture. Praise God. And in our immediate passage, we see that Jesus says right before our passage, he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from the Father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. So let me conclude. Let me conclude here. Jesus calls us, but he also goes before us. In Mark 10, 45, he said, the, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus understands that his core identity and purpose is to go to the cross. He, he continues to pursue that. Even when his mother and his brothers come to him and say, hey, what are you doing, Jesus? Come with us. In Matthew 13, he says, who are my mothers and my brothers? But those who do the will of my heavenly father. And then ultimately, Jesus fulfills this in a way that we could never imagine. When he's on the cross in his cry of dereliction, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's done this for you and me. And praise God that he's, he's done this ultimately. He's performed this in a perfect way that we can lean on him when we are weak in this area. But the big question of this passage is this for us. Here's the big question for us. We know that we can rely on Christ and he's done it for us. But it's, it's this. Who do you find your identity in? And security. Who do you love? Who do you follow? Jesus. Jesus, brothers. Jesus, fathers. He wants us to love him more than anything else or anyone else in the world with no exceptions. He is more than enough. God acts. God loves. God lays down his life and he calls us to follow him. And if this is too much for you, and it's, it is too much for me often, I, I find great assurance in, in Paul's words that my, where, where he says, God, God told him that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And that's the gospel. 
That through suffering there is triumph, through division and warfare causing chaos, there is peace. And through death there is resurrection and eternal life. Death is swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that death is swallowed up in victory. We thank you for the work of Christ. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.